good thing is that everything that you need to do to stay healthy is free. Your brain and your body works better when you're exercising. So you have a turbo experience for your brain so that most people come back changed and know more about how they want to spend their lives. Hormesis is a voluntary activity that you do that is a stressful activity that challenges your body and uh, mind to do a hard thing. And that once you recover from it, it makes you stronger. Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast. Let's meet today's guest. Welcome everybody. I am incredibly excited to have our guest today who is, uh, I got to meet this past summer at a conference in London in person. And he kindly shared his book with me. And I had the ability to read this book on one of my many flights and review it again before this. And I tell you, this is, this is a really incredible conversation and a really incredible tool and a really incredible book. Very much following our methodology of test and assess and address, um, Dr. Farrow is absolutely someone who is passionate about this as well. And we're going to dive in today about a topic around, can your pulse reveal more about your health than you ever imagined? So Dr. Toral Farrow believes that this tool can be very instrumental in helping you optimize your health. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Toral. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Nisha. Very nice to be here. So great. And, and well, kind well, words. Yeah. Oh, well, true words. I mean, it was great. You know, when you have books handed to you all the time when you, and I'm a voracious reader, I love to read everything. Um, it's just a joy when you find something that actually sparks something in you. And your book did that. The Pulse Cure, The Revolutionary New Way to Balance Stress, Optimize Health, and Live Longer. And the book doesn't even, the title doesn't even quite articulate what this is all about, but I'll, I'll throw the word um, into the mix so people are, are wanting to stay present. We're going to talk about heart rate variability today. But before we do that, Doc, I would love for you to tell everybody about your background and what called you into medicine to begin with. Yeah, uh, my background is uh, being a general practitioner and emergency physician in Norway. Uh, I've always been a freelancer and that was um, my intention from the start because I wanted to become a doctor to be able to travel the world, to live a free life, to be at the front row of life, you know, experiencing the life of the patients, but also to have the freedom to go around the world and work, either working as a doctor or just be working in Norway as I have done, working in Norway and then going and traveling, doing photography, teaching photography. Um, so that has been a way of living my life. So um, mm -hmm. and, uh, strangely enough, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in health in itself or helping patient in itself. That was kind of what I had to do to get this kind of a life. So, um, so my approach to medicine is a bit different than many other doctors. So, uh, um, but what got me interested in health after uh, some years uh, was that my father died and he died at 73 from cancer, which is why I'm particularly interested in it. And of course, I didn't want to share that uh, destiny. Mm. So I took a look in the mirror. I recognized that I started to look like the majority of my patients. I had done everything wrong. Everything, all of my advice in the Pulse Cure, I have done wrong. So I'm not uh, writing the book from the position of the know-it-all person. Um, so even though I was a doctor, I did everything wrong. I, I, I was 20 kilos or 40 pounds overweight, did not exercise was uh, drinking alcohol, small amounts of every day, uh, did, didn't care what I was eating. I was, um, well, not in a good direction because, because, because I was focused on traveling around the world, sailing with my family around the world. So, um, but then I saw that, okay, I need to change my lifestyle here totally. So then the last uh, 10 years, I've been changing it, everything totally around. And um, this is part of the pulse cure then. And the last years, five years, I've been using technology 
to track the heart rate and heart rate variability to follow these um, lifestyle changes because everything that we do right will be shown in the heart rate. Yeah. The heart responds so quickly and so precisely to stress uh, what stresses our systems. Mm. So, um, so that is what the Pulse Cure is about. I love it. One of the things you say early on in the introduction of your book is that people's bad health choices gave you your career. It allowed yeah. that freedom. But ideally, the shift for you happened, like you said, about a decade ago, where you realized, I don't really want to propel my, my passions in life on people's misery, on people's illness. You instead had this realization that you could still have the passion of travel and pilgrimage and et cetera by helping people maintain and create health, which I think yeah. is a really remarkable shift. Yeah, because that's, that has always been the frustration for me as a doctor. And the reason I wasn't so interested in health was that it didn't seem very useful what I was doing at the doctor's office. You know, people coming with their complaints and their illnesses, expecting some pill or some, some uh, you know, getting to the next specialist. Uh, and um, it didn't seem to help much. And uh, the frustration was that even though I could clearly see that they could do something about their own health, they were not very motivated to receive that message. Mm. So, um, so that was frustrating. So, but then through the work that I do now, then I help people helping themselves and to avoid getting sick in the first place. So, um, and what I'm doing is, or what the wearables are doing is that they're taking the power from the doctors and the healthcare system and puts it into your own hands in real time so that your numbers is not only accessible on your doctor every third month, but, but as you, as you live your life and, and the heart rate that these monitors will keep track of what is happening to you while you are busy with your life, you know, while you are communicating, doing fun things and whatever, um, it will keep track of what's uh, of the effect on your physiology. I love this. And before we dive even a little deeper into what is heart rate variability and what is the research and what are we looking at, you know, what is it helping us uh, understand about ourselves? A theme that comes up for you in the beginning of your book, especially, and then woven throughout the entirety of your book is this concept of pilgrimage, of a journey, of an mm -hmm. understanding of a self-inquiry and you know and, and, and your the the experiences you've had in your life create a metaphor around health creation as well and um i was really intrigued i mean to me i the person not your credentials mean far more to me and you have had a very extraordinary life of multiple hats that you've worn from of course medicine but also like you said a photographer a, an, an adventurer an explorer um, but I'm just curious uh, because I'm also someone I did the community de Santiago for my 50th birthday a couple of years ago and it was life-changing not everybody has the ability to take five weeks off of their life and get out there into the world but you've done documentaries about pilgrimages, the Nidaros um, Cathedral in Norway, the Santiago de Compostela in, in Spain. And I'm just curious if you could share maybe a bit about that part of your life and how it impacted the way you think about your own health and maybe uh, how it influenced this metaphor about health as a journey. Yes, uh... I became aware of the Camino de Santiago, the pilgrimage in Spain from the work of Paulo Coelho, who uh, wrote The Alchemist and who was kind of the, the force behind the renaissance of the Camino de Santiago. And I was already then interested in finding ways to educate people to improve their lives. And then I knew that walking the way to Santiago for these five weeks, as you say, is life-changing for so many people. So we made a documentary walking the whole trip, carrying all the equipment ourselves and interviewing the people on the way to let them explain why are they walking there? Why? Because they're trying to find a new direction in their lives. And uh, so that was very meaningful um, to do the job. Uh, and uh, I loved uh, the journey. And uh, actually, after we made the movie, the number of people walking the Camino from Norway doubled after that and stayed the double amount. So we 
I've heard so many stories that people started doing this uh, walk after they seen this uh, movie. So, um, and of course, it's so important for people to try to look at their own lives from a distance. And you get to do that when you walk the Camino, where you walk in northern Spain. So you walk from from um, uh, place to place. Uh, what do we call it again? The albergues, the hostels, or yeah. And you are by yourself. You put your phone away. Um, you walk either with a friend or alone, and you get to meet your thoughts. Uh, you need. Uh, you get to look at your life until then make plans for the future and um, you're able to think more clearly because when you're walking it's like your thoughts slow down to the speed of walking and it's like you your own size is held down by the media by all the commercial interests so that your life is very small when you start but it's like your life gets to its real size and and you can feel the importance of, of your own life and uh, what to do with it. So, mm. uh, and that is why it's been so life changing for so many people. Of course, you have the same in the U.S. with the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and all these different trails in the U.S. So you don't have to come to Europe, but it's this long walk. And of course, your brain and your body works better when you're exercising. So you kind of have a turbo. <laughs> experience for your brain so that most people come back changed and, and know more about how they want to spend their lives because and that is the basis of health because I am not so interested in, in having optimal health I'm interested in, in having a normal health so that you can live your life and that disease and symptoms and poor fitness level is not in your way um, and you don't have to spend so much time achieving that and um yeah. yeah i love this because it feels to me like your life experiences have led you to understanding the human condition in a unique way and have, and also come to understand tools that can help people understand their own human condition in a unique way and so one of the other things you talk about which really piqued my interest as well is i've been a huge proponent of uh the uh, adverse childhood events score, the, the ACEs, are, they're well known, and their impact, the, the stage they set for your resilience to, you know, life challenges and to health. And um, there's a few things you talk about in this book are things that will vary our ability to have the healthiest life we can. I mean, like you said, lifestyle choices and, and those things can hinder us, but so can a few other things that just give us a little... Uh, extra mountain to push or extra mountain to climb. And so you talk about the work of the Body Keeps the Score uh, book, which very integral into my belief systems around uh, trauma and its impact on your health response. But you also can, uh, will be talking a little bit more about the science or the physiological changes that happen with trauma in the body or stress in the body. But you talk about the variations of things like your gender, the era of your life, the trauma history, the um, season, and how it impacts the human condition and the uh, ability to be resilient to, you know, to all things. So could you maybe speak a little bit about some of these patterns and why we're not like, you know, we are dynamic. We're not kind of hmm. static in all of yeah. it. Speak to that. Yeah, maybe we have to define heart rate variability first. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so heart rate variability is a variation between heartbeats that can tell us in which state our autonomic nervous system is in. This basis of our brain, this, this base that we share with all vertebrates, all mammals, um, the, the basic system, which is divided into the sympathetic mobilizing part and the parasympathetic, restful, restorative part. And luckily, the heart rate can tell whether we are in the stressful state or in the restful state. If you're in the restful state, when we breathe in, the heart rate goes up a little bit. Uh, and when we breathe out, the heart rate goes down a little bit to save some energy 
while there is less oxygen in the lungs. But if you are in the stress state, the body, our ancient mind, interprets it as if we are in danger and we need to push through uh, with a heartbeat even if we are breathing out and there's less oxygen. So then these devices can track whether we are in the full stressful state, like full alarm, or if we are in the deep restful state. And it will keep track of it in the moment and accumulate it throughout the day and night. And um, so we need to have a good variation to, between the heartbeats. And there are so many things that can affect that. Like age, as you say, when we are younger, we have a better heart rate variability as a sign that our system is working more smoothly. As we can all see in the skin of young people, you know, and in their ability to go on a party and still be able to function the day after and so on. Um, and the way that athletes after their 40 will, except for Tom Brady and some people, will have big trouble, you know, maintaining their, their, their fitness. Um, and the heart rate variability will be worse as you age, but it will kind of reach a plateau from your 40, 45 and then onwards. So um, the HRV has a lot to do with age. And then as you say, it can vary with the seasons also. So in the summertime, when we get enough sun, that is so good for our cells, uh, that will improve the mitochondria, improve the nitric oxide and uh, our circulation, circulatory system, and give us vitamin D, of course, and testosterone and, and so many other things. We are, of course, developed under the sun for millions of years. So, of course, an organism that did not learn to uh, exploit the energy from the sun uh, would not really fare well in, um, in evolution. So we need the sun, uh, of course. And in the summer, our heart rate variability is better, uh, which is the reason why in the wintertime, when the HRV is lower, there's more disease. Like in Norway, there's 20% there's more deaths in the deeper winter than in the summer, like from February to July. And um, so there's a big difference here. Um, but there's a lot of things and we can do uh, to improve the heart rate variability through exercise, through sleep, through breathing, to breath work, uh, to eating right, um, uh, uh, drinking minimal amounts of alcohol. So many things we can do to influence this basic system, I must say. I love it. It's so amazing. And so could you just take a moment and help, even though uh, we've got a pretty sophisticated audience, I would love for you just to briefly describe the basic physiology of stress response, the acute versus the chronic, and maybe touch on the concept of hormesis, because you do talk about this as well, that mm -hmm. it's not just across the board bad. Right. And so I'd love for you to yeah. explain that. <clears throat> yeah. So we have a physiological stress response that responds more or less in the same way to any kind of demand. So it's kind of one system that uh, will release cortisol from the adrenal glands um, that will, you know, uh, increase blood sugar, increase heart rate, uh, make us ready for action uh, in the short term. Um, and we're supposed to do that. Um, that is our survival mechanism. That is how our ancestors have been able to escape uh, lions and have been chasing mammoths and so on. Um, so that's very important <clears throat> that we could do that. But we are made to shut that off afterwards, mm -hmm. to just relax, go sleeping. You know, it just was dark for 12 hours. Uh, they're all asleep or lying by the, by the campfire. Um, so what is the problem now is that we keep the cortisol flowing um, at a little uh, slower rate though, but it will still affect the whole hormonal system, including the female reproductive hormones and the thyroid hormones. So it will, um, and it will also make the immune system not function properly. It cannot work where it should work and it could do damage where it should not do damage. Um, and, uh, and that is, uh, is the problem. You're mentioning hormesis and hormesis is a voluntary activity 
that you do that is a stressful activity that challenges your body and uh, mind um, to do a hard thing and that you can once you recover from it it makes you stronger so that could be exercise it could be doing lectures it can be walking to santiago uh, it can be any any strain that you put on yourself it could be going to the sauna doing a cold plunge all of these um, activities um, but the bottom line is that we're supposed to have a good balance between stress and de-stress uh, we're supposed to push ourselves uh, and even hard and to rec make sure that we recover and grow stronger from it and it's this system that is now not working and is producing a chronic low-grade inflammation in our bodies that affects all our organs and including the brain and that will give symptoms and, and uh, diseases even cancer uh, in all of these organs and the problem is that we as doctors have been too divided there's been a kidney doctor and a heart doctor and the brain doctor and the ear nose and throat doctor and the, they've all been looking at their part of the animal and they have not for some reason until the last few years seen that there's a root cause of all this and that is a uh, chronic inflammation and heart rate variability is kind of a, a measure of this inflammation of the state in our immune system um, that also Jenna Makiyoki, who has uh, had the, the blurb on the front page there, says that the heart rate variability is a measure of the state of our immune, immune system. Which is so huge because a lot of folks are still resistant to the research around, uh, you know, stress and, and on our physiology, which is really strange because we actually have a lot of, of literature around this. And um, I think that it's just so remarkable. We, we like to test things. We like data. And the heart rate variability tool is one of the most powerful feedback tools for the clinician, but more importantly, for the patient. And you just described so beautifully that it's just helping you understand where you are on the continuum of the balance, because all of us will vary, right? Things happen, life happens. What I think is really remarkable is that there's still a conflict or, or, or a controversy around the impact of stress, you know, on our lives, that it's not quite uh, made it to the mainstream for whatever reason in medicine. And, and I think part of that is that doctors aren't even aware that there are actual tools, specifically a tool that can measure exactly what you just described, this, this balancing act between you know, a, a hyper-functioning immune system or a non-functioning immune system, a hyper-inflamed environment versus a non, a hyper-sympathetic versus a parasympathetic. We have this tool available to us, and that's the HRV that you've been describing. And so what I think is also remarkable is it puts the power into the clinician's hand to understand what's really going on with their patients, because all of our patients either a, think they're in stress all the time, or B, think they have no stress. And this is that biofeedback that empowers them to start to understand what's happening in their lives. So um, I would love to understand from you how you would explain this from the vagal nerve theory, how HRV interfaces with that, because there's a lot of interesting studies in that arena and maybe tell the, our listeners mm -hmm. what I mean by vagal nerve or, you know, the vagal tone, mm -hmm. vagal nerve process or self-regulatory yeah. mechanism. Yeah. So the vagus nerve is, uh, is the most important thing regarding heart rate variability. So the vagus nerve is the nerve that gives the signals from the parasympathetic part of the brain. So that is mediated by the uh, vagus nerve from the brainstem and out to all the organs in the body. So it kind of tells you about the import importance of this nerve, that it goes to all of your organs and down regulates it and makes it ready to recover. Um, and the heart rate variability is in part a metric on the effectiveness of your vagus nerve. Um, the better your vagal tone, the better your the conduction in your vagus nerve, the better the heart rate variability. So, um, so um, that is actually what we are measuring. If you cut the cut the vagus nerve to the heart, for example, it will go for 120 beats a, a minute, 
um, because it, it will be in the sympathetic mode all the time. So it's kind of that we have a, a gas pedal that is frozen on full speed. And what we have is the brake pedal, which is the vagus nerve. So um, we can train the vagus nerve by doing the breath work, by using the cold, um, by and, and just by letting it do its work, by sleeping enough, by relaxing enough, it, it will do its work. Uh, when we are active, when we are busy, when we are always doing some things, we are kind of keeping the nerve from doing its job, um, uh, so to speak. Um, so um, you had another question too that I, I think that was forgot perfect. now? Um, you know, and I think that one of the points about the vagal nerve, it is the master of our self-regulation. And so it's the... Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's dependent on our input <laughs> and it gives us yeah. immediate feedback and it's just another way to think about it. One thing that struck mm. me... And, and, then, and then, then these wearables is yeah. kind of a speedometer for the activity in your vagus nerve. So you kind of can see how it's working, you know, in, in uh, real time. So it's um, yeah. that is why it's so much easier to, to navigate when you have this speedometer compared to that it's totally in the blue, that you have no idea what's going on. So it's, um, that is how you can have a look at it, yeah. That is so brilliant, it's so brilliant. There were a couple other things that really intrigued me I'd love for you to touch on um, in this conversation. One of them was the impact of genetics on our HRV. This, this statistic was quite interesting to me. Um, could you speak to that? Yes. So there will be around 30 to 15% genetic uh, part of the number that we get in our HRV. So we shouldn't compare our uh, heart rate variability to another person. If you go to a big population study, there will be the higher the heart rate variability, the better the health and the better the longevity and, and the risk of disease and all of that. Uh, and the lower the heart rate variability as a sign of a the system under stress, um, there'll be more disease and a, a shorter lifetime in average, on average. But if you go and look at two people, you cannot uh, think like that. Then one person with a 25 in heart rate variability can have a better objective health level than one with 50. So, um, so you shouldn't compare yourself to others. But of course, the lower the heart rate variability, the larger chance that it, it, it will be a problem, but it, uh, not necessarily so. So, and this, there's a big difference in population studies versus the number of one studies, because you can see that if you go and look behind the numbers from the average that we use as doctors, you know, as doctors, we relate to big RCT studies. Uh, we control groups and all of that, maybe maybe 10,000 people in a study. And what we are presented is the average, right. what the average person will get out from this particular medicine or activity or whatever. But you can see, if you go behind the numbers, you can see that that doesn't matter at all because you may be on a total different ends of the spectrum. And what these variables do is that they give you... Um, the reading of how you respond to certain things, because we see it's very individual, mm. how you respond to alcohol, how you respond to eating candy, how you respond to a certain exercise or cold or heat or whatever, uh, will be very individual. Um, so, and that is the good thing about it. So you kind of don't have to wait for looking at some research because you will feel it immediately. You, you will see how, how you will react to a certain stimulus love that and it's you know when i think about some of these single nucleotide polymorphisms i can look at some people's you know snip roadmaps and and can tell that they are wired for stress you know kind of excessive stress response so things like their catecholamine um, genetics things like their um, faah so all, all about their kind of bliss point you know different things that help me understand that hey this person might need to work on their stress response a little bit more intensely because they've been a little bit wired or the blueprint they came with might make them more predisposed to this, but a tool like HRV can help them manage that and express their genetics in a different way. Yeah. And it's not only genetics uh, that you of course know more about than me, but also you mentioned the ACE test and 
people who have experienced a lot of trauma in their youth uh, or childhood, they have a nervous system that doesn't really allow them to relax. It's mm. kind of they have to be told on the watch all the time. So they, as you say, have, they have a higher mountain in front of them from, from the start. Uh, and they have to be particularly careful to to down be able to down regulate their nervous system because they have uh, higher mortality, you know, all through their lives. Um, so it may be particularly uh, hard for them to be able to down regulate. They have to be particularly patient in the work to find out what what can uh, get them into the good Vegas tone. That's so powerful and. One thing that just blew my mind, and I don't know, as I was saying before we started recording, uh, probably because I've now crossed over the menopause bridge, so I'm not following things through my cycle as much anymore. Um, but I was really, and I, it's just so common sense. I'm so surprised that I just didn't really connect it. But um, I really would love for you to talk about the heart rate variability changes through a woman's cycle, cycle of her life, and cycle through her monthly cycles as well. Yes, so we can clearly see from the heart rate variability that it will vary a lot in the menstrual cycles. And I mean a lot, um, because when we can see the, the downshift in the heart rate variability the week before menstruation, it's as deep as uh, having COVID. It can be even deeper than having COVID or going for a week, uh, drinking on a party week on a spring break or whatever. Um, so it's like having covid once a week, you know, for for all your reproductive life. Wow. But, and that's the interesting thing. I thought it had to be that way because I saw all the curves from, from all the women because we, we have a we have a place, it's called um, the pulsecure.com in, in Norwegian. It, it, we're building it up in, in um, for the international audience as well, but we have 4,000 members in the Norwegian one. And all I could see was these... Uh, curves from the women with PMS symptoms where you can see this really deep downshift. Wow. And they even had the PMDD, the dysphoric disorder, which is even more, more serious. And um, I thought, okay, well, it's just uh, shows how it is. But then a lot of the women started mitigating the stress in that week and they could flatten that curve totally and get more or less totally rid of their PMS symptoms. So, if you have PMS symptoms, it's, it's not the way it's supposed to work. It's not unavoidable. You can go in and then reduce the level of activity, sleep more, eat better, uh, uh, downshift your exercise uh, regimen, rather go meditating or doing yoga instead. And then you can get a lot better curves and you don't feel the same way either. So, um, so that has been uh, something that I, of course, didn't know about. Um, but I, I, th there are lots of women having experienced that. I think it's really amazing because our friend, you know, our friend and colleague—I know you uh, quote her in your book as well, Dr. Mindy Peltz. You know, she talks about the importance of cycling your fasting around your menstrual cycle as a woman, as a woman of changing that. So of course, that makes sense. You're going to need different things at different mm -hmm. phases. And I love that you talk about—you don't have to be a victim of these symptoms. You do not have to be a victim mm -hmm. of what is perceived or normalized in our culture of the yeah. way it is. Yeah. So you can enhance yeah. and, and override those patterns by shifting things mm -hmm. throughout your cycle where you need to, you know, like you shouldn't be hard. Like, uh, I love the book you know, the old, uh, the book, um, the red tent. And it's like this lost art of women getting very still and present and quiet around their cycle, you know, around their bleed. And that, in our culture, we don't get that opportunity. It's like push through it, push through it, push through it. And it's just hmm. incredible that you even have the data to show, hey, this is, you can do something about yeah. it. And the way we can fast or not fast around this time as well. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, and uh, and it's uh, it shows that it's not just a feeling. So when you feel bad, you know, and, and you're snappy and, and uh, frustrated and, all this, it, it's not just a feeling, it's a physiological load on your system. And, and the reason why it is like this is that the cortisol from your stress will have a feedback function on your the pituitary gland and your hypothalamus, and it will disturb the release of progesterone that will protect you from these feelings. So it kind of holds the progesterone low 
Um, but uh, and once you reduce your stress level, you get more progesterone and you feel better. So that, that is the mechanism behind it. I love it. And it also puts the power back into you know, the women instead of medicating themselves through this process to stabilize their hormones, understanding their hormonal milieu with a tool like HRV can help you make the lifestyle and dietary changes that will actually smooth the ride even more. So I think yeah, that's yeah. yeah. And before I forget, of course, if, if you Google heart rate variability and the different form of cancers, you will see that there's a connection there. Uh, you will see that there's a connection in the risk of getting cancer. Once you get cancer, it will say something about the prognosis and the risk of, of metastasis or spreading of the cancer. If you get cured in the first place, it will say something about the risk of getting a relapse also. Wow. So it's um, because there's so much uh, research on this and I'm, I'm not sure if there's a research on every kind of cancer and that you can find it on every kind, but you will find these uh, research papers on all of these uh, different aspects of cancer. And, and you probably know more about that than I do, of course. And no surprise, because we definitely know that, first of all, patients can't even respond to a treatment if they're in a sympathetic nervous system overdrive. So I don't care how good the treatment is, how good the chemotherapy or the radiation or the alternative or integrative therapies or the diet, you know, the ketogenic or the fasting. If you are not self-regulated, if your vagal nerve is not working correctly and your nervous system is uh, out of balance, you can't even receive your therapeutic input in a way. So I know that to be the case because I see this all the time in practice. I'm definitely going to go down the rabbit hole and pull up some of the research and literature to back this because I see it clinically. I feel it and note it intuitively. And I love that there's actually data um, backing this. So I will go down that rabbit hole for sure. What a, what a, what a very uh, compelling. I had, to have. Yeah. For example, I, I have a, uh... Every year, uh, and I'll actually on this Sunday I start, I have a workshop for cancer patients in photography, in, in using photography as a mean of, of presence and, and you know, mindfulness and, and so on. And uh, last year, uh, one of the participants, and they all had cancer or are in the process of cancer then. Um, and they, one person, she started to use the watch and she saw that she had a stress level of 60 which is very high. I have never had such a stress level in, in, in my experience. And so that was her stress level. And then she took it upon herself. Okay, let me try to follow every advice in the book. Let me take five days of fasting, mimicking diet, go to my cabin, just bring a book, just walk slowly, just be in nature. And, and, and she had a stress level of 17 on a daily average. Which is just a, which I have never had. I, I have never had such a low stress level, but it shows that you are able to regulate this. Um, you just need know to need to know what to do, and to know which device to track this, so that you have the speedometer. Because it's like we're getting what we call in Norway getting speed blind. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving at the interstate. Uh, say that you break the speed limit and you drive for in, in 120 20, uh, miles an hour, right? And then you break down because you have to go to the gas station. Mm -hmm. Then you almost want to go out to the door before you are have stopped because because you 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 think you are standing still, but you're still running maybe 20 uh, miles an hour. You know, I have experienced this in the autobahn in in Germany. And it's like that. We are, we, are, we are so used to this fast-paced life that we think that we are in the restful state when we are not mm. um, because we haven't experienced it and we haven't had the speedometer to, to show that we still have quite a high speed. Mm. So uh, that is what these devices can, can do for you. Well, let's talk about that because there's a ton of gadgets on the market. And you do. I love that you take it upon yourself to talk about the differences, you know, that are out there and, and your favorites, your picks in this, because it, there isn't like, it sounds like the way you describe it in the book, there's not like one best one because they all have pros and cons, but could you mm. speak to maybe the, you know, four or five that you do feel like offer some, uh, speedometer checking for, for, for folks? 
Yeah, so the best one, the best choice would be the Garmin watches. Um, that is because that they have been smart enough to buy the Finnish company First Beat Analytics and take their 20 years of experience and put it into their watches. Wow. So, um, and that is the most accurate uh, one. That That's the one you can use as a speedometer in, in real time. And, and um, you get this body battery system that they have. So at this point, they, they are by far the best. And then you have Apple Watch, you have Fitbit, you have Samsung watches, and you have, I think almost any watch, any smartwatch will have some kind of HRV reading and give you some estimate of your speed that would be far better than nothing you know yeah. and you have the rings you have the aura ring uh any moment now samsung is coming with their galaxy ring and their new system that uh, i'm looking forward to to see how that works um the apple watches they are not so good uh, unfortunately uh, they probably have to step up their game but there's an app if you have the apple watch and you don't want to get rid of it it's an app called Athletic, which is a combination between athlete and analytic, athletic, um, that is quite good. Uh, so uh, you can use that. So, um, so you have these different choices, um, but I must say that Garmin is, uh, is the best one at the moment, but there is so much happening. And, and that is a good thing that now there is money in, on the front side of disease yeah. and not just on the back side, because there's too much money to be made from sick people. And uh, and and not to cure them totally, but to to keep needing these medicines for their metabolic uh, syndrome and and the results of this inflammation. So now there's financial interest in giving you products that can keep you from getting sick. Yes. So that is very um, a good thing in my mind. I love it. It's like you are taking us to the next level. You're showing us the next level that an HRV a day will keep the doctor away. Instead of the old yeah, one. right. Wow. <laughs> That's I'm right. That's right. That this is where we're moving into. My gosh, Doc, you. This conversation is going to be so and, empowering to so many people. And 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 the good thing is that everything that you need to do to stay healthy is free. It yes. does not, and that is and that is a problem. So there's no commercial pressure behind it. So you you feel you have to do something that people have to pay for. But the, you know, getting sunlight is free. <clears throat> Being out in nature is free. Exercising is free. Um, being more cold can be cheaper. Um, and uh, sleeping, of course, is free. Meditation, breath work. All, all of this is free. It's, it's also, it can be just as cheap to buy real food, real whole foods and not ultra processed foods. So, um, and, and staying away from alcohol, you know, of course, is cheaper than buying it. So... So, uh, so it's uh, available to anyone. Uh, and so whether you are poor or rich, you have the same chance of avoiding disease. It's only on the backside of the disease that there will be a big difference whether you have the finances, particularly in the US, of course, to, to buy the best doctors uh, or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, these tools, like you said, the, the, the tools to change our HRV are available to all of us and are accessible to by all of us that are relatively, you know, completely free or very, very inexpensive. I think that's a really empowering piece of information. The HRV devices themselves, can you give us just a sense of the price range? Because this could yeah, be... Yeah, the, um, yeah for, the, the Garmin watches would be from like $150 uh, and upwards, um, where you would probably get 80% of the use for the $150 and then the more expensive that it comes because then they have the heart rate variability over time and they also have better measurements of exercise um, and that would be particularly important for people in a fatigue situation because even a, just a walk in the park can be a hard exercise for them so so they should also do it even if they think they're not uh, training um, so, and for $300, you, you would get that level of, um, watches. And then you have even one more level at, at, um, probably $600, I would guess, and upwards, which has a very good, um, exercise assessment. 
Mm. Um, but but it is available, you know, even to cheap prices. So if you buy it secondhand, of course, it costs almost nothing. So uh, and yeah, most of the other watches, I think, also can come at the prices, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars. So. Um, and so, so for some yeah. people that might feel like a stretch, but when you look at what you're learning, what you're saving, what you're preventing, you're paying for your healthcare prevention now because it's a lot more expensive to pay for your health loss later. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. And it and, and, and you will perform better. So the same the same strategies that keeps you healthy and living longer will also make you feel better, well being, and it will help you perform better at work on your family life and and also so it's a it's a win win situation and all all and it's it's good for I get I'm on so many lectures for companies and businesses because the business owners know that if we can get people to have a better stress balance they perform better they are not sick as often and are happier so uh, so uh, in this place uh, both the employer and the employee is uh, on the same side. Ugh. I love this. I mean, my gosh, this is this should be across the board um, a, a, a part of all of our medical systems. We should all be given an HRV device just for our self monitoring and our self uh, accountability and changing things up. I mean, it's it's a game changer. So I'm yeah, yeah. Really, really excited to share this conversation with our listeners. Now, I would love for you to tell us how to find you, how to learn more about you, how to find your book, The Pulse Cure, how to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can uh, find me at uh, thepulsecure.com. So, so far there's a lecture there. That's a one hour lecture uh, that they can see. And we are also now in the process of building up a social community that we, the same way that we have in Norway, where they can ask questions so they will help each other. And we have classes and online courses and all of that. Um, the book itself, the Pulse Cure, is um, available everywhere. It's uh, like on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and it's also an audio book. There it is. <laughs> it's also an audio book and an ebook, um, so you can even get it on your iPhone on your on the book app there. Um, and on Instagram, I'm Dr. Torkel. It's a mixed site. I try to make as much uh, English uh, content as I can, but there's also some Norwegian content there. Um, I found it too hard to have two separate uh, uh, Instagram sites, but uh, I'm available there. So, um, yeah. Beautiful. What is your next adventure? What's your next pilgrimage? My next pilgrimage? I'm writing a book first. I'm, I'm just in the process of uh, finishing a book uh, probably called uh, The Rest Cure, because that that is the hardest thing for people to rest. So, so. Uh, I will finish that uh, in um, and it will be out this January in Norway then. And uh, then I'm starting to write the book on sun on this on. Yeah, because we have been totally misunderstanding the role of the sun uh, makes make it an enemy instead of a friend. And it's uh, been a huge mistake. And there's a big, big research now in the UK, 400,000 people showing that the more sun you get, the healthier you are, even with the sun beds, with the solarium. So, um, so there will be a total shift in the way we look at how to get sunshine. So it's, um, oh my gosh. I'm looking forward to get started on that. So there's um, a lot of people have to change their minds. So, um, so, so that. those are the kinds of adventures. Now I've, I've kind of, I've kind of made my own prison now. You know, I, I'm used to go traveling and be able to go, you know, work for two weeks, have enough money to sail away. And now, you know, being in this uh, writing process with all this uh, and, and, the, and the book has been just a huge success in Norway. It's been on the bestseller list now for one and a half year. Wow. And there's every day there is something. Just today, there's a big piece in a newspaper. I have to go out and buy it. So <laughs> because it has really changed and, and put the Norwegian the ones that are interested in health in Norwegian has taken this to their heart and really changed everything. So it's a, uh, this it, has the potential of, of turning the whole healthcare system upside down. And that, that, that I knew from the start that, that it has the power to do that. So, so now I have my own prison. So, so but I have, I've bought an RV, I bought a motor home so I can at least write things on the road. On the road. <laughs> so, 
I love that. I have to find a solution. You are, you are being very creative and pivotal in this. And I'm looking forward to the next book on the rest cure and the sun cure. Would love to have you back for a conversation around both of those. But I think you very much answered the question today of where we started today, that is there something that your pulse can reveal about you and your health and your life patterns that you never knew before. And I think you were able to answer that very, very, very well for all of us. And I'm really grateful for your yeah. time and your passion. And I must and I must say one more thing to that because because uh, all our senses are very good, you know, directed outwards. We can see 10 million colors. We can smell 1 trillion different smells. Uh, we can hear a twig breaking, you know, far away. Uh, and, because all our senses have been evolutionary, been directed toward outward threats. Mm. But this is the first time that the threat to our health comes from the inside and we can't feel our own stress level. I would not know now if I have 60 or 85 in a heart rate. And that sh will be a big difference in inflammation level and stress level. And still we can feel it. So it just tells you that our inner sense has not only been been um, perfectionized it has even been muted you know so that we we really can't feel that because it would disturb the attention from the outside threats you know we would have been eaten if you had felt uh, the stress level so uh, so that is why we can use these wearables as substitutes for this sense that we never needed to develop because the heart rate will respond very quickly to to the slightest uh, demand on its uh, system, whether mental or physical. So, yeah. so uh, it's just important to say that. Yeah, it's a perfect truth bomb in, in carrying us out of this conversation. What, what an amazing conversation! What an amazing book! And what an amazing human and life um, you've you've led. I can't wait to see what's what's to come. So, thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Wonderful to be. Thanks with for you. having me uh, on your show. Thank you.